Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, right now, kids can make their way to Children's Church. The rest of us can turn to Philippians chapter 2. Kids and leaders can make their way to Children's Church. That's four-year-old to fourth grade. If you have notes there, it's in your, they're in your bulletin. It's how should we then live. That's, a, that's kind of a throwback of a 1970s a book title by Francis Schaeffer. I think it's fitting today. It's a brilliant passage in Philippians 2. It's actually called the Hymn of Christ. It's a famous, famous passage in Philippians 2 that we were looking at last week that begins with, have this mind be among yourselves in Christ Jesus, or though he was in the form of God, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself. And a beautiful passage. Watch what happened here, though, is it should have, could have, then launched into this unbelievable, lofty description of God's salvation, Jesus, but he went the other way. He actually now names three things that we need to do in light of it. Look at this turn. It's so profound, this hymn of Christ. It's lofty. It's lofty enough that we read it and we go, okay, yeah, that's, that's not practical. I mean, that doesn't help me today. And yet it does. So remember, the deepest of theology should also be the most practical of theology. The deeper somebody gets, the more practical it should be. Because it takes this turn. Didn't expect it. Didn't see it coming. This past week, I, uh, a week ago, I had to get rid of a washing machine, and I didn't know where to get rid of a washing machine. I knew that throwing it over a nearby hill was not the right thing to do, although I saw lots of washing machines that way and tires. So I got a lead on Brookman's Recycling. Do we all know where that is? Okay. Wow, don't go at night. It's scary. I mean, it made Sanford and Son look pretty clean and neat. I mean, it's good old-fashioned. This is just good old-fashioned recycling. So I pull up and weigh the truck with the washing machine, go dump the washing machine, weigh it. I go walking inside, obviously new at this, and, uh, and he looked at the weigh-in, and he gives me a piece of paper. He goes, 980. And I'm not kidding. I went to reach for my wallet to give him 980, and while I was, he was handing me 980. I went, oh, I'll take that. He goes, no, that's fine. Like, you can give, and I said, no, you mean you're paying me to, to take this? And he goes, yeah, so this, I honestly did not see that coming. That was Dave Hapchuk put me onto that place. He was out of town. I called him, and I said, I just made 10 bucks. And he goes, what did you think? It's recycling. I'm like, I didn't see that. Totally out of nowhere, didn't see it coming. I honestly do think this text took us quickly into a direction that we didn't see coming. It is so practical. After so much theology, Jesus, in fact, some of this theology, this is the famous kenosis text that every freshman in college, in Bible college, spends time on. That's the words on the first part of verse 7, he emptied himself. We talked about that last week. That's, the word is kenosis. He emptied himself. What does that mean? Theology. And then all of a sudden, it's so practical. Look at this, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. After all this Jesus talk, after all that we've done with it, with beautiful stained glass and churches and we have cathedrals, and after all of this, what's it come down to? Therefore, meaning in light of this, therefore, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's the first thing he's telling us to do. 
the word, I don't normally want to mention anything with Greek, but this, there's an, oh, they have a way in which to emphasize a word. We don't have that. And there is great, strong emphasis on the word your salvation. Work out your salvation. After all this talk, after everything churches have done and after everything that's going on and everything you know or don't know about Jesus, therefore, I'm telling you, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, with great reverence and respect. Work out your salvation. Salvation is simply the deliverance of, from sin and consequence of sin into fullness of life, relationship with God. We have salvation. Faith in Jesus does that. Work it out. Not work to get it, but work it out. You have it. Allow it to keep going and work on it. Your salvation. So what's the, what's the process? How, how is it being worked out in your life? See, so often we have somehow conveyed that salvation is a prayer and a decision that's made, and it's the end of the road. I've put my faith in Jesus. And yet that's the first step. That's not the last step. The first step, faith in Jesus, and now we work this out through our lives and make it apply and get into our bloodstream and our life. Work it out. Your salvation. I know you may find this really hard to believe, but I don't work out. No, seriously, this body, it doesn't work out. Theoretically, I've heard of these places. There's like facilities that have stuff, like heavy things to lift up. Horrible idea, but there's places like that. Do they have, uh, let me just ask around, okay, do they have like snacks? Is there like a cafeteria, snack area? Ernie? You just said yes. There really isn't, is there? What's that? Oh. There's two words that have never been put together before in my life. Healthy snacks. That's hilarious. You're funny. You're saying funny things today, Ernie. So if you wanted to work out, if you wanted to do that, which is a great idea, there is a bit of a plan. Maybe you do something different Tuesday, Thursday, or you certain pieces of equipment, you're using different things to kind of holistically kind of work out. Work out our salvation. What is it? What's the plan? So when our son, when he was 17, ended up and landed that 1977 Cadillac that is now somehow in my garage, right? It's in our garage. So at 17, he's driving this old car, and it was in pretty good shape, and one of the first things, he had furry dice hanging from the mirror, right? Uh, I just told somebody the other day, we put curb feelers on it. How many of you have no idea what a curb feeler is? Younger people, do you have any idea? Nope. Jesse? I look at young people, and Jesse's over there saying, no, I don't, you really don't? Oh, that is so sad. John, yes? Okay, yeah, you watched Starsky and Hutch, Huggy Bear. Yeah, we know about the curb feelers. So I had curb feelers put on it, and it was a, it was a, so once we got it, the fun began. We didn't get it and park it in the garage. Once we have our faith in Jesus Christ, the fun begins. How can I grow? How can I become stronger? And very much like working out, not a bad idea to get a trainer. Let's get somebody who's done this to direct us and move us along. It's called discipleship. We find somebody who's been down this road who can help us make our way down this road as well. Chapter 2 said we have a whole lot in Jesus. We have encouragement, comfort, fellowship, affection, sympathy. Then we even have the example of Jesus. Let it work its way out. Let it go. Let it work its way out. 
I read Warren Wearsby. He was in a Moody Church up in Chicago for many years. Listen to this sentence he gave, and I, I don't think I have thought of it quite this way ever before. All of us must be like Christ, but we must also be ourselves. That's why there isn't one exact plan that we all do, because you're very different. That would be the same as working out. What are you intending to do? What's the purpose of you particularly working out? What's your state right now to bring you into some balance physically with cardio? You're very unique. And in your uniqueness, you work out this faith that you have in Jesus Christ very specifically for you. Some of you read your Bible first thing early every morning. I mean early every morning. Others of you, early at 10 o'clock. Was it Mark Lowry that said, if God wanted us to see the sunrise, he would have put it in the middle of the day? Yeah, I kinda, I'm kind of for that. I get that. It's unique to you, your personality. If you're on a sports team, how do you work your relationship with God, how does it play out on a sports team? How does it benefit them? How are we to live in your family or at school? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Look at this funny one Then he adds. Really, out of everything, do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of the crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Think of this a second. Do all things without grumbling and disputing, that you may live blameless and innocent children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. My mind went to politics immediately. We're about as damaging as the world because of grumbling and arguing and complaining. We're just doing the same thing. We just have different views. Because he specifically mentions grumbling and disputing blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. It is so easy for the Christian to sit back and just complain about what the world is doing. Can you believe that Congress passed that? Can you believe the school district is doing this? And we just look and we dispute it and we argue and complain about it. Does that sound familiar? Well, it's that step back to say, as you and I are working out our salvation with fear and trembling, we have the truth, we have the life, we have the light to shine, which is what it tells us to do, holding uh, blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Not throwing more shade, it's lights in the world. We roll up our sleeves and we engage working out our salvation. We're going to bump into each other. There's going to be grumbling and complaining. But it's interesting that he's suggesting us not to grumble and complain. It was a funny story of two two guys working on, their, on those uh, I-beams, you know, those old pictures, of skyscrapers of New York City type thing, and they were sitting there eating lunch together. And as they sat, the one guy opened up his lunch, and he said, Ugh, peanut butter and jelly again? And he's frustrated. Day after day, he's doing this. He opens it, peanut butter and jelly again? And one day, he just crumpled it, and he just tossed it down onto the street. The guy next to him said, you really should probably tell your wife to pack a different sandwich. 
And he said, don't bring my wife into this. I make my own lunch. <laughs> We're just, there's just a, nat we can complain about ourselves. We just naturally complain. I don't want to be on the sideline and complaining and pointing. I don't think you do either. This has been such an amazing transition for both Sarah and I coming here because there's good dialogue, there's disagreement, but I'm, it's not complaining and grumbling. There's a right big difference. Things that we want different, yeah, say it. Let's talk. Let's figure this out together. But we're not seeing that. And I just commend you as a congregation, those of you that are here, those of you listening online that didn't make it today, it's really impressive how this one, I don't know how that happened. It's very unusual where there's good ideas or bad ideas that there's healthy dialogue around it. And just as a side note, we're grateful to be here in Pennsylvania. And we do like Pennsylvania. It's a beautiful area. But we like it because of you guys. That's what we came here for. That's what we're here for. And I want to mention, again, this is a bit on the side. If this is your church, whether you're a member or non-member, or you come once every, six, uh, once every six weeks, however you happen to be, this is your church which means I'm your pastor, I'm available for you. So as you're struggling or you just want to talk something through, you need to know you're welcome to come in. Make a phone call, send an email, check in. I would love always to sit with you. And whether you're a member or we see you once every eight weeks, this is your church. And so we certainly are happy always to talk to you and meet with you. And it's really easy to do at this church because this point of which Paul has encouraged is certainly not a problem. The grumbling, complaining, bitterness, sour spirit, it's just not here. It's just good, healthy dialogue. Take a look at this third point. This third point, beginning in verse 16, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. And you likewise should be glad and rejoice with me. He tosses this drink offering thing in, it's kind of a unique offering. It's only mentioned three times in the Old Testament in Leviticus. And it was a, an offering that's known in other religions as well. What was unique about it was a drink offering goes with another offering. It's not on its own. It's a different one. It's a tag-on. It's a liquid. It's a strong drink. And what's unique about it is that particular drink offering when it's offered, is completely all totally burned up, nothing left, gone. So with that in mind, he says, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ that I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice. If I am just wasted away, I am just, God decides to spend me on one night. I'm just gone. I did something, offered myself to God, and it's over. And there are those among us that has happened. We know family members with us for a brief time. I don't know why. We'll never know why they're gone when they're gone burned up, it's gone, it's over. But God, was it right? Yes, it was. It's okay. It's okay. And Paul says, if that's how I'm spent with you, I don't mind because I know you're holding firm to the Word. Paul's the one that led them to the Lord. Paul's the one who's teaching them. But they're holding firm to the Word. Not him. He is thrilled. He goes, I am so excited to know 
that you're growing in your faith, that this process, this working out your salvation, you're not grumbling and complaining. You're holding firmly to the Word. I'm so grateful for that. I could be burned up. I could be wasted away, and yet you're okay, and I'm rejoicing in that. Once again, a plan. What is your plan of holding firmly to the Word? Well, we hold firmly to it. The Bible says the grass withers, flower fades, the Word of God stands forever. It's like the pillar in life. It's the thing that doesn't move. Are you holding firmly to it? Evidenced how? In what way are you holding firmly to the Word? I think a lot of you are reading My Most First Highest, right? Some of you are reading that. And if you didn't get a copy, they are still in the lobby. You can still jump in. We're reading one of those a day. Many of you are in Wednesday night Bible study. Y'all are welcome. We do have unhealthy snacks at that particular study. What's your relationship to God's Word? Would you call it holding firm? That's fair, isn't it? Kind of a hero of the Christian faith is a guy named Dawson Trotman. Who knows who Dawson Trotman was? Yeah, okay, several. Founded Navigators. Uh, Dawson died at age of 50. Um, I sent a note to Ledbetters last night. Dawson Trotman was born in Bisbee, Arizona. Yeah, down in uh, the, a border town where a friend lives. Uh, Dawson died kind of, um, uh, as you say, accidentally, unexpectedly, at age 50 at Scroon Lake Word of Life Camp. Do you have anyone been there? Anyone grow up going to Word of Life? That's uh, a great little Christian camp. Uh, he saved a girl from drowning, and he, he drowned in the process. But this was his shtick forever. Dawson, Dawson's the one who brought any type of form of discipleship that there ever would have been and was in Billy Graham Ministries. It was from Dawson. Billy Graham reached out to him and said, would you come and help us? But he had his own ministry of navigators. This is what he was known to do. Dawson Trotman, small group, dozen people, as which commonly he would do, often uh, uh, Navy sailors. That was his thing also, helping uh, in, with the Navy. He would grab his Bible and he'd hold on to it, and he'd say, you've got to hold firmly. And they're like, yeah, got it, got it. And then he'd turn his hand around, and he had words for each of his fingers. He said, you need to hear it. So think for a minute for you. Are you hearing it? Are you putting yourself under hearing of God's Word regularly? You need to read it. Is there some type of a pattern in your life where you're regularly reading? Something's set up. Perfect at it? No, no, no. That's okay. But there's at least a plan. You hear it. You read it. You study it. Actually take pencil out and a pen and make notes and try to figure things out and study it. The fourth one is memorize it. I think a lot of us have trouble right there. Actually taking it long enough to memorize it. And then Dawson was known in these meetings as he would sit there and explain and his personality uh, he was hilarious. He just lit a room up. He was fun. And he's sitting in that small group and he explains the four and he turns his hand around and he says, and meditate. You have to meditate on God's Word. And meditation is as easy as what you did during communion. That was it. That's all there is to it. You literally put a verse in front of you and you just sit there and you read it, and you read it again, and then you may pause and go, huh, and then you read it again, and you just think about it and read it. 
and rest and relax and allow it to work its way into your mind, down into your heart. Because once it's in your mind, and you and I give enough time to allow it to sink down into our heart, it'll make its way to our feet, and we'll actually walk it and live it. We hold firmly to the Word. What do we do in light of the sacrifice and example of Jesus Christ? What do we do in light of that? We're considered equality with God, something to be grasped. He's God. And yet He emptied Himself. For you and me, He emptied Himself and made Himself a man. He actually took on human form to the point of death. No, even death on the cross did that for us. So what do we do in light of that? Where do we go from that spectacular truth of which there are volumes and volumes written on that amazing passage? Where are the volumes and volumes written on what Paul followed it by saying, then do this? He actually told us what to do after it. Study it more? Yeah, study it more. No, work out your salvation. So we go from here, and I hope this is an anchor for you. I hope Sundays are helpful for you in your walk with Christ. But this is simply that locker room talk. This is what this is. We're in the middle of a week where we just join together. It's a Sunday waiting for another week to go by. We're in the locker room to talk it all through, but then we got to get out there. And we get out there and we have to have our plan to work out salvation. Watch the grumbling and the complaining and hold firmly to the Word. I thought it was funny in this conclusion by, by Paul that uh, there's three things. There's, aren't there always like three things? I actually read about that this week, that authors, it's, it is a literary technique to have three of something. Two just isn't enough. Four is too much. So three. Three, there's a completeness to it. Way back that some of you were here, my first message here, which would have been, what month do you think that was? Mark? Do you know? Was that October? No, 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 no. Um, no, I came September 11, so yeah, like August or something like that. We talked about the holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, that it's three. Three is more the completeness of it. So if I said friends, Romans, you would say, oh, that's good. Some of you have painted in your kitchen, live, love. Oh, that's so cute. That is so cute. Do you have dish towels like that? Cross stitch, is that a thing anymore? That'd be a good one to cross stitch. Okay, guys, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Very good. Very good. Um, I came, I saw, I bought a t shirt. That's right. That's right. Came, I saw, I bought a t-shirt. Okay, um, I did read a funny one. Uh, where is, uh, is Joe in here? Joe Sistick? Is he out? Oh, he's downstairs. We let him with the kids? <laughs> he's what? Security. Okay, that's better. That is awesome. A plumber his whole life. Here's three things, the, three things that, the only three things a plumber needs to know. I found that this week. Water runs downhill. Don't chew your fingernails at work, and payday is on Friday. Those are the three things. Good for him, working security down there. That Joe can do anything. We're left with three things today, and I want you to think of the three. I want you to first commend yourself on one of them. Commend yourself on one of the three. You really do have a pretty good plan working your way. You're working out your salvation, having it play itself out. That might be a strength. 
Maybe it's the grumbling and arguing. No, nope, that's not what you're known for. At school, on a team, you're not the one that just brings people down with the grumbling. You've, you've got that one figured out. Or it might be the third one that you go, yep, I'm pretty good at that. I hold pretty firmly to the Word. Commend yourself on one of those three, but then let's take one. Let's take one the rest of the week and let's work on it. Which one would it be for you? You think your salvation is more past tense? There's no blossoming, moving forward? You've not, you're not working it out in your life? Maybe it's the grumbling and complaining. Maybe it's that you're not holding firmly enough to the Word. Are you going days and days without opening up the Word? This might be the one then for you. Think through of which one would be best for you, and let's turn it over to the Lord in prayer right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the minutes that we've had together today. We've celebrated your table. Thank you. Thank you for Jesus. And Heavenly Father, we do want to be stronger. We want to be blossoming and growing in our relationship with you. So Heavenly Father, I ask that you would give us that encouragement. Give us that nudge to work on one of these three areas. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.